Welcome to the AMATIC 2018 webinar series. Today's webinar is Needed Math for STEM Technicians, Solomon Garfunkel and Rodney No. The sponsoring committee is MAC, which is the Mathematics and its Application for Careers. Please note that the views expressed by the presenters are not necessarily the views of AMATIC. Commercial products mentioned by presenters are not endorsed by AMATIC. And our sponsor is McGraw-Hill for the webinar series. Thank you, McGraw-Hill, for sponsoring the webinar series. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenters today. Very good. I'm going to get a different screen up here. There we go. Well, first of all, I'm Rodney Nall. I'm coming to you from Road State College in Lima, Ohio. Lima is an acronym for Lost in Middle America. So, uh, and uh, Saul. I'm Saul Garfunkel, and uh, I'm coming to you, to you from Bedford, Massachusetts, the People's Republic of, and uh, <laughs> I'm the director of COMAP. Very good. Um, we're here to discuss with you the Needed Math Project here, an NSF sponsored project uh, out of Hofstra University. And, uh, Thought we'd start things off with this. Uh, those of you who know me know occasionally I find uh, learning opportunities in humor here. Um, and I'm kind of grateful that Jeff McNelly, the original uh, creator of this script, didn't pick on math, I guess. In fact, I'm not even really sure it would have been as funny if he'd used math. So uh, uh, I'm glad he's picking on English right now. So let me. Um talk about a little history here. Um, when we weren't the first project to look at this issue about education when it comes to trying to get the best possible education for students in order to get good jobs and retain those jobs as technicians. There's a prior uh, project and a prior report that I worked on and some other key EMATIC people, uh, such as Rob Kimball, um, which was sponsored by NCEE, uh, National Center on Education and Economy. And the report came out in 2013, and it was called, What Does It Really Mean to Be College and Work Ready? Uh, obviously a takeoff on some of the language in the Common Core uh, State uh, Math uh, Standards. But the issue was looked at in this report from the point of view of two-year colleges. In other words, we, um, in, in this particular study, we looked at um, eight major uh, two-year associate degree programs. Um, I'm, I'm going to forget all of them, but there was biotech and business and IT and automotive tech um, and nursing. And the, the question was, what did we require in the way of mathematics um, for people to go through those two-year associate degree programs, and then compare that side by side with what the actual discipline asked for. So what we did was we read uh, a lot of textbooks, introductory textbooks in nursing, in IT, in uh, business, uh, in accounting. Um, and we looked at those 101, 102 courses, if you will, and looked to see what math did they actually use as opposed to the math that was required. Now, by the way, the math that was required, either as prerequisite or co-requisite, was almost always some variation on algebra two in high school or um, college algebra in college. And what we found was, not surprisingly, that these introductory courses uh, in the major uh, two-year programs, associate degree programs, did not in fact require much mathematics. Most of the mathematics was middle school mathematics. And then we had this really neat quote that said that much of, uh, that is taught in high school isn't needed, much that is taught in middle school, middle school isn't learned, and some topics that are neither needed, uh, that are needed and learned are not learned. So I didn't get that right, but you, you can read better than I can read. Um, the point was we were doing a bad job. And we were doing a bad job from the point of view of what we were teaching, how the schools were reacting, and the courses that we were offering 
for people who were going to go into essentially entry level technician jobs. So that was purely look, that, that program and that report, which is rather interesting, worth reading. That report looked at it solely from the point of view of school, of what we were offering as two year college teachers. The question that the Needed Math Project looked at is what do employers see as their need? Not what are we teaching to satisfy what we think their need is, but how do they see their needs? Rod, you want to take, take that? Yeah, I'm trying to click my screen here to make it go ahead. There you go. There we go. Um, there might be a typo here. I'm not sure if they're investigators or instigators, but the originators of this project, um, you, you see listed out here, Michael Hacker and, uh, hang on a second, I'm sorry, I've got a screen, and Paul Horowitz, um, both of which ironically are self-professed self non-math people. Uh, although as a physicist, I'm not sure that's a, a, an appropriate disclaimer for Paul. Um, I, I found it, kind of fascinating to be contacted by these folks doing an NSF funded project uh, in about mathematics education that wasn't coming from that particular community here. So I, I, they valued the importance of math, they valued the concerns that were being addressed here and stuff enough to go to the effort to put forth this project and uh, do a lot of work here. So I think kudos certainly goes to them for the initiative to address some of the concerns that have been brought up here and um, some of the um, ways we might address those concerns, I guess. So, there we go. I think the point here is the steering committee for this project, um, and you'll see that uh, both uh, Rod and I are on that. Um, put this up just to show you that we really weren't only looking at the two-year college teachers, but in fact, a rather um, broad spectrum of educators in different disciplines, as well as um, actual people who work for a living, um, members of people who were in the industries themselves. So it was quite a broad uh, range of uh, expertise that we brought to bear on this problem. And that, that broad range of expertise showed a lot of different facets, I think, to the questions that were brought to the table and stuff. So, uh, again, the, the diversity of, of uh, input here was, I think, one of the strengths of the overall project. So, again, the, the principal investigators there, I think, did a great job of getting a, a broad spectrum of input into this project. So, and I think the steering committee reflects that. So. And the principal investigators actually listened to them, which was rare. For the, th there was, uh, before we get too far into that, a very concerted effort to get input from everybody and to try to, in the, the findings, represent that fairly, I think, despite, uh, you know, the difficulties in doing that, I guess. Um, the Needed Math Conference, an overview here. My clicking is just not working appropriately, Julie, sorry. There we go. Trying to get to pop up. Um, the conference itself was held early this year in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, the focus here was on entry level STEM jobs and community for community college graduates. So when we were talking to the employers there, it was important to emphasize that particular focus on the discussions, uh, not you know future career aspirations and things like that. A uh, total of 50 participants were brought together, again, representing the different areas. Um, the different areas, the disciplines that were represented were advanced manufacturing, information communication technology, and biotechnology. And the principal investigators did a fair amount of research and put a fair amount of thought into selecting those particular discipline areas. I think they are well represented within the ATE, National Science Foundation Advanced Technology Education projects that you see funded throughout the years. Um, I think they're well represented in the economy in terms of the uh, jobs that are 
available for STEM technicians and the uh, funds and resources and possible growth in the workforce in those areas. So these were, were not come up with randomly here. A fair amount of thought went into focusing on those three discipline areas. And there it goes. Um, we also had at the conference high school and community college instructors that were in those STEM disciplines. And then, well, we're gonna be talking about the math. So we wanted the math educators and researchers represented as well. So those were sort of the, the communities that were brought to the table at the same time. And in my experience anyway, kind of a unique uh, assemblage of folks having the employers there, the discipline specific instructors, and then the math educators and researchers at the same time, which I think was a real, uh, positive uh, mixture of stuff. There, there was potential conflict, but I think it worked out very nicely. Prior to the meeting, prior to the conference, the employers were asked to submit uh, example or representative workplace problems in their respective areas. And 29 of those were uh, given to us prior to the conference as a basis for the analysis. Those are all available in the final report stuff, which we'll give you reference for here uh, later on during the talk. Um, so you can go through and look at them uh, at your leisure here. We didn't want to take time to uh, read through those at this point. So the charge to the conference um, was, and the outcome, was to begin to identify possible changes in curriculum and instruction that would reflect the mathematics needed by the entry level STEM technicians to be successful and productive employees. And I, I want to emphasize that there were two pieces of that. We'll come back to this idea. One is what do the employees, need, the employers need? What do they see as the, the gaps or the, the, put it positively, what do they see um, as things that they need their employees to be able to do? And then the second part of that is from the employee's position because what problems they work on today are not the problems that will be there uh, five years from now. So what kinds of mathematics uh, or what kinds of learning do they have to have so that they can uh, progress in their jobs, not just that first job, not just that first set of problems, but as they go on in their careers. Now in Putting together this uh, presentation here, Julie warned us that uh, we better not spend all our time just talking to you. We do actually want to hear back uh, a little bit of your, how do I want to say, um, perspectives on this thing. So we've got a couple of stopping points in here for input from you folks. And I guess our, our first uh, opportunity for that is right now. So based on what you've heard so far, any questions or comments that you'd like us to address? There's nothing in the Q&A box so far or the chat. Oh, now we do have, oh, someone said not yet. Not so yet, we answer. very good. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> okay, well, we have questions if they don't, so that's fine. So the next one is, if you get this group of folks together looking at this question of what is the math needed and how are we doing, what do you think we found out? Okay, we won't take names. You can. That's right. Put, put something down. <laughs> What's your intuition? What's your experience with respect to this? They ah. said, yeah, they, they, they're saying below average, uh, not algebra or calculus. Okay. So you think somebody put it in there? Well, everyone says algebra isn't so important. Very good. Ah, Michelle. Critical thinking. Nikki, very good. Back in the chat box, somebody said the ability to think in terms of proportions. Yeah, yeah. Proportional reasoning. Nice. Good. Communication, critical thinking. Yep. yep. One of the challenges, I think, with the with all the input that was received here was synthesizing it down to a handful of key findings. I guess um, I, I think the 
if you tried to capture every piece of input that we accumulated over the course of the conference, um, it'd be a very voluminous uh, report. Uh, and, I, and we really tried to get down to the meat of it, the, the most important thing. So I guess without further ado then, we have some findings to share with you. Let's see how good your intuition actually was here. Come up already. The gap between the textbook problems and the problems that arise on the job, even though the underlying mathematics may be the same. Is that a surprise to anyone? <laughs> I guess would be my, my question right now. Um, and, and when we say typical textbook problems, uh, I think most of the math folks have a, 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 in mind examples of that. Um, there are certainly textbooks that, that are not typical out there, but are those the ones that are in your classrooms? Are those the ones that uh, you're finding through, um, I, I, I'm not gonna refer to anything specific, but, but the, the resources and places that you're selecting your books from? And, um, that's one of the concerns I think that was expressed a lot of different ways. A second finding, if I can get this to click right. There we go. Gap between the mathematical preparations many students receive and the mathematical requirements of an increasingly technological workplace. So mathematics typically is what for these students? It's a general education requirement. It's something they take initially when they're in their, their uh, degree seeking programs and at the end of that training and stuff in the workplace the mathematics that they're expected to use not lining up so it's not just a, a matter of they got what they needed and they forgot it or they got what they needed and they're not really necessarily uh, able to do it there's, there's significant gaps that were identified without getting into the specifics right now. Third finding. So too many students cannot make effective use of technology commonly found in the workplace. So, um, Can we think of any examples of that? What would be a, what would be a commonly used uh, technology, I guess, would be one of the things we're thinking about here. Spreadsheets, very good. There you go. Spreadsheets. <laughs> that's 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 probably the quickest, fastest uh, answer that folks uh, have, and, and certainly appropriately so. I've lost my chat window, Julie. Where did my chat window go? She doesn't know. It's probably hidden, so you'd have okay. to hit, you'd have to hit the little chat bubble again. It's not available. That's why I'm confused. Oh well. That's strange. Let me, let me move on to finding four here. As currently taught and assessed, math education has become a barrier to success for many students rather than a pathway to it. Not something that's easy for us or me in particular as a math educator to hear folks say, but they do say it. They do express examples of it. They are concerned about it. It is, um, something that in that audience was a serious bone of contention. So um, in summary, I guess, uh, not, none of this is new. Um, there's been a lot of initiatives to, to, to undertaken to address this, but the problem still exists. Um, and I think the next phrase is important that we saw this, the people at the conference saw it as a shared responsibility, not simply, you know, you guys have done it wrong, but in fact, recognizing their own responsibility and that in order to affect real change and improvement, each community has an important role to play and collaboration among all the stakeholders, employers, instructors, math educators, parents has to be ongoing. I think, you know, for those of us who've been in math education for a very long time um, and have, uh, as in my case, worried about introducing modeling and applications and so on into the curriculum, we've been surprised at the quiet 
of um, uh, industry, uh, have, have, how they've more or less stayed out of the, if you will, the politics of uh, math education. But the people, at least in the room, and they, I think, were fairly representative, were clear that they understood they had a responsibility, that it wasn't enough to sit back and say, well, you know, these people can't do the work. We, we, we have to retrain them or whatever. They didn't want to just complain. I mean, they wanted to roll up, and they certainly did for the few days of this conference, roll up their sleeves and actually get involved. And, and I think that was heartening, if you will. Now, how to do that right is, is another question. But um, uh, there was no question that they, uh, they saw their responsibility and they wanted to become involved. Yeah, I, I'll echo what, what Saul relates there. Um, it, it, it was um, a, a very collaborative spirit that was brought to the table by these 50 folks uh, in terms of identifying and not just identifying, not just, not just grousing about it, but actually meaningfully communicating what the issues were and trying to work together to come up with ways of addressing problems. And I finally got my chat window back open again. Thanks, Julie. And we are at another pause point here, particularly since I'm having trouble keeping track of chats and questions and everything else. So uh, questions or comments so far? I appreciate Don's comment there. And, and this is, again, I think one of the strengths of the, uh, the meeting was that, you know, these issues have come up, came up individually in these communities for a long, long time, putting the group together, putting the, all the stakeholders, or, or the, the majority of the stakeholders, I should say, together in this group to address the issues is, is I think, the way it's got to be resolved, basically. So that's, that's an excellent comment. There was a question in the Q&A box. Um, and the concern is this, basically. It seems that it's not easy to connect algebra teaching um, to technical knowledge, even though algebra, or algebra is important to students. At least this person's inexperienced about trying to link those. Could you expand on the topic a little bit about math or algebra-related education with technical knowledge teaching, if possible? Saul, I think that one is probably yours. Uh, I, I think uh, Saul has, has built a career and company off of addressing that question in many respects. So, uh, Julie, could you ask that one more time? So, uh, so I, I think I'm just going to paraphrase because I was having a hard time reading it too. Um, it, it seemed like the the connection between we have algebra to teach, right, and how does that relate to but the technical aspect of, I have to go back to it now. How does it go back to the technical aspect or the technical knowledge? Um, how do you relate those two together? Like, you know, everyone resoundingly said spreadsheets, right? That you, got, you guys got tons of responses okay. to spreadsheets I got, I got about it. I got what the, the uh, disconnect uh, was. Okay, look, the, the, it's actually, this point is fairly simple. If you teach the mathematics um, as a tool and you teach it, on the side so that you know this is I, I often say this this is like saying okay we're going to learn how to hammer a nail for three years and in two more years we're going to learn how to saw a straight cut of wood now someday this will be useful to you but that's beyond the scope of this course uh, there's that thing called the house but we're not and we may want to build one one day but let's not talk about that yet let's just spend our time making sure we hammer that nail exactly right and that we cut that piece of wood and a straight saw. So that doesn't work, right? And we, 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 we know that doesn't work. It isn't, the case, it isn't that we don't want to be able to hammer the nail right, or we don't want to be able to saw the wood correctly, but we actually have to see the end product or the ways in which that's going to be used as we teach. I mean, this is just teaching math in context, showing teaching math as you need it, showing why you need it, not just saying, trust me, 
in the end of days, something good will happen because, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't believe in delayed gratification and most students certainly don't. So um, it doesn't stick unless you see how that material is used. I mean, I'm going to make this point first, I guess, but uh, I'm sure Rod is going to jump in on it. One of the things that we heard con consistently from the employers was that the people they were hiring quote, knew the math, they just couldn't use it. Now, to me, that's an oxymoron, right? That they knew the math. What did they mean? What they meant was they passed certain college algebra courses or some entry level exams that the employers themselves gave, and they showed the ability to do the technical, um, solve the problems, you know, solve for X, whatever it was, simplify this expression. They could do that. But when they gave them a problem, like uh, in biotech, and they were dealing with some sort of a complicated mixture problem, which is what a lot of the biotechnicians were doing, making solutions of different kinds, they had no idea. It isn't that they didn't, couldn't solve a ratio and proportion problem by itself off to the side with, that, with just numbers, but they couldn't do the translation. They couldn't do the mathematical modeling. They couldn't see how the problem fit, how the mathematics that they were competent in, in some sense, fit into the real world. And that you just don't, that doesn't come by osmosis. If in order for that to work, you have to teach the math along with the applications, along with the ability uh, to uh, translate from the real world problems into the mathematical problems and back again. And that's what people couldn't do. And there's something terribly wrong about how we teach mathematics. If an employer can say, well, I hired this guy, he knows the math, he just can't use it. What, what, what does that say about what, how we've explained to people what it means to know and understand how to do mathematics? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I can certainly add to that, and we have a couple of those issues later in later slides here. Uh, uh, so I, th I think I'm going to pause for a moment and wait wait for that time to talk about it. Um, I, I think some of the, the concerns brought up here, you know, about uh, algebra, for example, and stuff are, are are certainly things that need to be aired out a little bit. I don't think folks were saying they don't need any algebra. I think their folks, in fact, many folks mention basic algebra skills as part of what they needed folks to be able to do, but being being proficient with those and being able to recognize when they're the appropriate tools and being able to recognize how to use those appropriate tools in that setting to solve problems, that's 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 exactly where folks were having issue. So. So I think you got most of the questions about like the technology focusing on that, except for I think we missed one in the chat. It was, let's see, it's rolling away from me now. <laughs> um, given that technical careers are so different, how can we create meaningful curriculum or courses without creating 20 different specialized courses? So I'm not sure that you addressed that one yet. Well, I think Saul hit on a key component of that. The, the idea of, and I don't really care which class it is, um, the modeling component, realizing that there's a problem that you want to solve, not knowing immediately that it's the title of chapter two that's the appropriate way to, to, to solve the problem, looking at the confounding variables involved in it, uh, figuring out what's important, what's not, can I solve it, can I solve it, having some sense about what the, the uh, answers ought to be and what the the constraints are that you're operating under are, are issues that permeate all the math classes that you've got, I believe. So. No, that's exactly right, that modeling is the key. And um, that's a skill in and of itself. And, and I don't care whether it's third grade or 13th grade, that's a relevant thing that needs to come across in those mathematics courses, I believe. And that does also address this issue about the employee. Because if, if that employee can model, then, then the problem that he has to solve or she has to solve five years from now is not all of a sudden a new, totally new problem. They yep. can 
learn as they go and, and they can progress within the company. And it's very important. Uh, there we go. So um, you've heard the findings. You've addressed some of the issues. What do you think you ought to do about it or we ought to do about it? Saul and I are prepared to vent about a number of things there. So uh, <laughs> we'd love to hear some of your suggestions first. Uh, they were all pretty fired up a minute ago, but <laughs> they're not answering you now. Fair enough. Ah, there's a few chats coming through here. I'm I'm trying to get caught up on those. This multitasking thing is is not mm -hmm. my forte all the time. You chewing gum? <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> so what they were saying was that um, official AMEDIC statements can have power. And that's why we're here. Indeed. And now they're coming in too fast that I can't read them either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> when the moderator is, is can't keep up, we know we're in trouble here. <laughs> um, trying to concentrate on applications. Let's see. I, I love... Uh, the one comment here, I try to concentrate on the application exercise at the ends of the chapter to illustrate where the math is used. And 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 therein is is one of the things I don't see in the workplace. The applications aren't at the end of the chapter with lots of predecessor skill building and stuff like that leading up to them. Uh, the application problems are at the beginning of the chapter once they get in the workplace, I guess. And, and, and a good comment there about, you know, reading comprehension is a factor there as well. Yep. Yeah. And someone's already mentioned communication. Yep. Because it does no good if you can't communicate your solution to somebody who needs to know it. Yep. So we did make a set of recommendations. Shall um, we? We can talk about All right, that. more of these. I'm, I'm looking forward to going back and grazing through the, these chat comments here. It, it's, it's difficult to manage all of them in progress here sometimes, but uh, uh, they're very much appreciated and we'll look forward to going through here in a little more detail as time permits. Oh my, now they are coming in. And if you write Rodney, I'll give you his email address. There, there you go. <laughs> Let's get into the recommendations here. Number one, place greater emphasis on contextualized instruction at all grade levels and in all mathematics courses. I, I think that's an overriding theme of a lot of the comments and, that we've already made and a lot of the feedback that, that folks are submitting here. Um, and, and, and I guess I would emphasize there, don't put it off until the end of the chapter after we've done all the skill drill kill exercises that, that endear students in the math classroom so very much. Oh, somebody agrees with me too. Always love that, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can see number two here. So make a shift in emphasis in the assessments that students must take. So this is sort of the common statement, but it's tautology or not, it's important. You have to test what you value. Um, if you do this kind of work, but then the test, you know, is back to just the drill and kill stuff, um, it, it won't work. And people argue, I, I, I understand it. I've been on the Common Core writing team and all these other issues with the various park and ba smarter balanced assessments at the high school level. It's harder, it's longer, um, it's more complicated to uh, assess modeling, to assess uh, working um, in context, but it's not impossible. It can be done and it's worth doing. It's worth taking the time to do it. Um, and so, but again, this is a statement that says, it, you know, essentially says if you don't assess this, then 
it isn't going to be taught and it isn't going to be learned. So we have to think about how to effectively give the time and energy to assessing learning in context. It is not just the the students that respond to that. It is the teachers as well that respond to it. We you know we've heard the uh, comment, sometimes criticism of they teaching to the test. Well, if the things we're describing here are indeed valuable, let's make the test reflect that so that teaching to the test becomes a, a positive thing here uh, and something to strive for. And it, again, as, as several folks have commented, uh, the students will, will respond based on what you're going to assess them on. Oops. I will click here as soon as I can find it again. There we go. Number three, in all mathematics courses, increase the focus on topics, approaches, and pedagogy that better reflect the demands of the contemporary workplace. We've, we've made a number of comments regarding that, I believe, already here. The, the workplace environment where, math, where we ask mathematics to be applied is, is very unlike the classroom setting where we attempt to teach the mathematics. And the transferability of that, that mathematics experience from the classroom to that workplace setting is, is not a given. It, it is not something that we, we seem to foster extremely well here. It's not just the time lag, it's not just the, um, uh, the similarities in um, testing or something like that. It's a, a very different environment when you're asked to go out and apply mathematics on the job without all of the, the guidance that's sometimes provided in that classroom setting. And, and I want to go back to something someone said earlier. It isn't that if you're teaching some math for biotech that you only use biotech examples and they will only be of interest to students who are going to go into biotech. Um, it's broader than that. You can find examples, many of them, that come from industry, that come from employers, that will be of interest across a broad spectrum of potential uh, jobs that people might be looking at. So, so it's not that we're in the business of designing a program specifically for some uh, industry, some company. Um, we're looking at the broad issue of math education and saying that these kinds of questions students need to see, independent of what particular um, uh, area that they see themselves going into in terms of future employment. Right. Um, so it's, it's more that we, we see what the workplace kinds of questions are, not, you know, you're going to have to do this when you grow up. That wasn't the point. And, and, and again, a good bit of it, I think, is we need a person coming out of those math classrooms that can do math with confidence, with independence and without strict guidance about here, here's what you need to do on a step-by-step-by-step -step -step basis uh, and, and apply common sense to its application there, I guess. Uh, just as a quick example, one of the, in fact, I think it's the very first in the final report uh, application that the manufacturing folks submitted was what, to my quick, fast read, was a basic solution problem. We, we have a concentration of a sizing compound for doing uh, uh, carbon fiber uh, work, and we have to dilute it. And I thought, well, now that's a pretty basic algebra one level-ish question. So I took it into my college algebra class in halfway into the semester and thought, well, this is well within their mathematical prowess at the moment. But the subject we were in the middle of was nowhere related to that particular concept in the class. And I just put it as a pop question on a quiz out of nowhere, and not a single person in that class got it right. It's not because they hadn't, they did not have the mathematical manipulative skills to do it, uh, but they didn't have facility with that to the point where they recognized the application and could do it with confidence in that setting. They're just like, oh my gosh, where'd this question come from? And I have no idea how to do it because it's not what's in chapter six that the quiz is supposed to cover. And that was scary disturbing to me again.
Number four. Um, establish a separate mathematical groups pathway based on solving realistic problems representative of those that many students will encounter after they leave school. Um, I, I should say something about this recommendation because it's not my favorite one, but it is in the report. Um, as um, Rodham pointed out, the people who run, who were in charge of this project, the PIs, uh, come from outside of mathematics. And I think they felt that it would be too difficult uh, to uh, incorporate this kind of pathway into all math courses, which is the way I would have written this. Um, and so they wanted to say, well, okay, if you need a pathway for onto calculus ladder, take AP calculus when you're in seventh grade, <coughs> Banach algebra is an eighth and so on. We'll let you have that one, but give us a program for most people, a different program, a separate pathway where we could get this material in. Uh, actually, I think they're um, not as um, optimistic as I would be, or as probably Rod is, and I would hope that we would see this everywhere um, in all math courses. But nonetheless, that's a report to say minimally let us cool, um, have such a separate uh, pathway. I, I think Saul's exactly right. Um, it, it's something that it, clearly it's not a, a one easy fix type of thing that you can do at the, at the end of their educational pathway. Um, it, ideally, if we want that, that mathematics portion of their education to be something that is not just to the STEM technician, but, but to every student, something that is meaningful to them when they walk out the doors of academia, this needs to permeate more than just a, an individual sequence taken by a few folks. Um, so uh, we would like a, a more robust recommendation there, but it is certainly a start towards the STEM technician pathways. So. And last but not least, number five. This, I think, has already been suggested by some of the comments that we've, we've seen coming through here. Um, this is not a problem that's going to go away having a conference every once in a while and, and, and a collection of, of input uh, provided to folks here. There needs to be some meaningful way on an ongoing basis for addressing this and fostering uh, a community that will uh, take forth initiatives towards successful, successfully accomplishing some of these recommendations. To that end, uh, recommendation five says create a needed mass center charged with communicating conference findings uh, to additional stakeholders by holding follow-on meetings and publishing articles aimed at wide variety of audiences. And I, I think there's a, a number of issues in addition there that that, that center could uh, uh, put forth as well. And one of the questions that I, as a, a longtime AMATIC uh, member, uh, have to ask is AMATIC the place to champion such a um, facility? You know, I mean, one of the things that we found at this meeting, uh, and I think both Rod and I would agree, was incredibly uh, happy making was the willingness of the employee, employers to, uh, to, to work with us on, I mean, the, the report itself has 29 problems that they brought with them, all of which, by the way, would be wonderful to build curriculum around. I mean, uh, I'm a curriculum developer, so as soon as I saw that material, I could want to create modules in, uh, around that stuff. Um, and so uh, if that's not an accident if there are many more employers out there willing to uh, to get involved in this way i think taking advantage of that trying to hold this group together try to build it as a core and build it out would be terrific i mean uh, just just having those those examples in front of us to be able to say to students this is what this is what you have to do tomorrow you, you graduate tomorrow you walk out in the real world this is the job, this is the first question I'm gonna ask you. This is the, excuse me, first problem you're gonna work on. Um, 
how would you handle it? it, it it's a wonderful motivator. And I think uh, if we could get there political, you know, sometimes when you try to change education, it changes in um, archeologic time and moving tectonic plates. But if you have employers sitting with you saying, hey, this is what we need. This is what we want. Yeah. Uh, that that's that could be very powerful. Yeah, I agree. And Matic is an interesting place for this to begin. Those are the five recommendations listed in the final report here, and I see lots of stuff coming in on the chat. I'm getting a little bit more comfortable jumping around here, but not necessarily doing that. So I think we definitely need another one of these points uh, to stop and address some of these comments here. Uh, so you were just mentioning as a curriculum developer here, I think is very relevant to a couple of the questions that are coming up from Mike and Catherine and stuff about, um, you know, where do we get materials? Where do we get this expertise from employers and, and stuff that, it, that is accessible to the math educators? How do we, how do we teach in these new ways and, and where do we get the supporting materials and things like that to address that? Well, I mean, COMAP has been trying to collect a lot of this material for 30 odd years and put it out in modular form and other forms. But I think, as we keep pointing out, this is day to day. The technology is changing, the, the needs are changing, um, the careers are changing. Uh, I think we have to contact, we have to go through a MATIC. I think we have to contact our local employees, uh, employers. Um, Look, many two-year colleges sit in situations where there is a fairly large employer down the street who's, you know, to who, who we're feeding. And I think it's important that those contacts be made. I agree with Rod that doing this at um, the national level, doing it through Matic, makes a hell of a lot of sense. Um, but I think we start out by asking people, you know, what, you know, you're, you're employing what you a certain number of our graduates here, what do you want them to do? What, is it, what are the problems that they're having to, they are having to address? Um, and I think starting with this bit, the, what we've got in the report gives you a good idea of the nature of the kinds of questions you're gonna get. Uh, but no, it's a collection job. It's a data collection job. We have to go out there. And yes, it's true that, you know, we didn't talk about this a lot, but you would imagine, what happened is what you would imagine. There was a, um, there's a language problem. When an employer talks math, they don't use the same words we use. They, they really have their own language. And even when a biotechnician talks math, they don't have the same language the math department person has. So there is a little bit of time where you've got to work together to understand what you, you know, what, 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 what the words mean. They may use the same words, but with slightly different meanings. So that has to take place. I, I think it, 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 you can begin locally as well as uh, nationally. One has to go to the local industry, sit down and talk to them. So, you know, we want us, we want to do the best for you um, and get those examples into class as soon as possible. They, the, those employers and stuff are generally um, welcoming, I believe, of you approaching them and asking those questions. They, they, they're, they're delighted to hear that you want to know their uh, slant on this and are often more than willing to provide um, counsel, resources, um, and expertise to supply new initiatives. Um, a couple of the comments here about uh, classroom materials and stuff. I, I, I think Saul's uh, uh, work at COMAP has provided some very uh, non-typical, very unique materials that have address many of the things you're bringing up here. I know I was involved in a project with NSF um, that developed a modeling course primarily for the high school level folks. And I think it addressed a number of the, the issues that are brought up here in terms of thinking and utilizing mathematics to solve problems. Um, but there is a, you, you're swimming upstream in that high school environment many times there because the standard of uh, what I need to take uh, as far as being college prepared and stuff is um, difficult to break right now. So when I say I'm, I'm offering a modeling class and it's up against Algebra 2 or, um, or statistics or some variant of that, which all have various merits and stuff, they, 
they often kind of balk at it. It's a hard sell sometimes. And that's why I think that a lot of this stuff needs to be incorporated into all of those particular venues so that it, it's, not, it's not treated as a, uh, a specialized course, but is more uh, within the realm of all those existing courses. It's probably easier to, to do that way than it is to come up with that, that unique course that is taken by a few, I guess. Let me do one shout out to a report that Siam and Comet created recently called GAME, which is G-A-I-I-M-E, uh, GAME Reports, available from Comap or Siam for free. Um, and it talks about modeling from elementary school to middle school to high school to undergraduate and tries to describe how one can get materials in there. Um, I think it's a good report. I think you're right. It's two M's, one I. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I think it's worth it's worth reading. It gives very nice examples, for ex instance, between a math problem, an application problem, and a modeling problem, and a word problem, and a modeling problem to show the difference. Um, and I think it's it's quite useful. Um, so it's worth it's worth reading. It's free. You can get it from Comap or get it from Siam free for download, um, and it's very helpful, I think. Before we run out of time, um, you've heard the recommendations coming through in the report. Is it a pipe dream? Are they relevant? Are they actionable? I, I, think, I think the writers of the report would really uh, like to hear some comments regarding that. And being cognizant of time, because I know Julie's eventually going to throw up some kind of, of uh, thing, I want to get to a couple last slides here that I think are Saul and I's opportunity to go off, off script just a little bit. Uh, we were sometimes referred to, I'm not sure whether it was a compliment or, or just a descriptor here or, or something else, uh, as the two math guys hanging around with this group of folks, particularly in the steering committee here, we had a few math folks join us uh, and, and we're very appreciative of their, their uh, input and, and uh, work during the conference. But during steering committee meeting, meetings, we were often pointed to here um, and had serious counsel here after the, the conference proceedings to kind of see if we had heard the same thing, so to speak. So. In particular, we wanted to focus on that employer's input because that was, again, really unique to this, this assemblage here. Um, and we heard some interesting things. So some of which we're really happy about. It, it, was, it was abundantly clear. Now, granted, these folks came by invitation to this. Some of them even paid their own way. They felt that strongly about what the, the, the conference was focused on here. And they unanimously, conveyed to us math is a valued commodity in that workforce and in their business in that setting. So that was, that was delightful. Um, I want to get to a couple of these though. Um, there's a concern about the availability of the qualified workforce, the quality and quantity of folks available to them. We've related that to a degree and the issue of math being a potential uh, barrier to that was on the table from time to time. Some of you already mentioned this. When they're referring to those STEM technicians as new employees, one of the common things that they said is they need to be able to think. You can, you can substitute a lot, a lot of words in there, problem solve, use common sense, have reasonableness, you know, degrees of magnitude, all sorts of different variants of that. But, but think was the general descriptor that they used here. And that didn't just mean doing a procedural type of, of event. And then, the one that Saul brought up, it was probably our favorite. In fact, I think after about the third or fourth time we had heard this one, um, I glanced across the room and, and since we promised Julie no profanities during this, and I'm not a perfect lip reader, so I can't quote him exactly, but we were, uh, our reaction to this, they know the math, but they can't and fill in the blank, several things were said there, was it's just wrong on all levels to hear that. That said, we've looked at it from the employer's perspective. Let's look at it from that student turned employee 
and a couple of fundamental important things that Saul's related here. So I'm gonna get both of them up here as time permits. We all know walking out the door of your institution into that first job, it's probably not gonna be their, their career job. Maybe it's not even their career company. They need skills that are going to afford them the ability to do many things in their career. And they need to learn more than just how to do one or two or a very small number of specific tasks that they're assigned to. So we're getting close to the end there, time-wise, et cetera. Would you like to add something to that? Well, I'll throw one thing in from the employer's perspective, which was interesting. Um, they made it clear that in terms of hiring people, if they paid enough money, they could get, they could find people who had the qualifications on paper. It just was on the job that they couldn't do. In other words, they couldn't, yep. they couldn't pay enough money to get someone who could actually, you know, figure out what's going on, but they could get enough money to get figure who could pass algebra two, or pass you know, college algebra, or, you know, who, who on paper looked right. That they could do. But the idea of modeling, the idea of somebody could do that, that was not something that they saw out there and they didn't know how to teach it. In other words, they could take that first job and say, here, you yep. want to make that solution? Do, it's, do step one, two, three, four. We can teach it. But what about when we change step two? You know? And that's where they, they, they saw the need and, and that's where the employer, employees have the need. Just as and, one and therein is that third bullet point. I, I uh, copied that right out of one of Saul and I's email uh, exchanges here. It's, that's a quote from him. And I think that summarizes it extremely well. Um, again, before we hit the timeline here, um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time to do justice to that input point. So if you want more, here's some places to go. The first website there is the website for the Needed Math Project. The final report is available there now as a PDF, I believe. So you can access it there. Also, you can catch this show at Amatic this November here. Um, I will be doing a chat and chew on Friday morning with Aaron Altos, and there will be a panel discussion on Saturday. Saul will be one of the star features there, and Michelle Yonker, Rob Kimball, and Stefan Brado. So that, I believe, is, hang on a second. Yep, I think, I think we're at the end there, Julie. I think so. I think so. I do have a little survey um, for people to do. And of course, I goofed up my PowerPoint. I didn't have it in show mode anymore. <laughs> and now I have to go way fast, so don't get dizzy. I thought I started at the right here, but I didn't. <laughs> Thank you so much for participating in today's AMATIC webinar. Before you leave, if you could put into the chat window just to thank um, Rodney and Solomon for their time today and sharing this information, I would really appreciate that. To support future AMATIC webinars, please join AMATIC, bit.ly slash join dash AMATIC. We are on social media, uh, besides the AMATIC Facebook group, each region has a, a group now as well. You might wanna check that out. Um, recordings of past AMATIC webinars can be found at bit.ly slash AMATIC dash webinars. It usually takes us a week or two to produce and upload the webinars to this archive. I'll try to do it a little faster, knowing that um, the, the follow-up to this uh, webinar is happening at the conference. Uh, please take a few minutes to evaluate the webinar content and the presenters. I missed an S there. Um, you can go to bit.ly slash amatic75. You can scan the QR code reader or let me grab that link for you. I do have it handy. Let's see, chat. I'll put it here in the chat window as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And I will remain on in case you have any questions or um, concerns. Let me go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>